Welcome to Affecting Autism. Today we're discussing the psychology around one of the biggest challenges for many caregivers who choose DIR floor time for their children with developmental challenges. And we have with us a returning guest, DIR expert training leader, psychologist Ira Glavinsky, who has a background in psychology and special education and runs the Glavinsky Center for the Child and Family in West Bloomfield, Michigan. He also co-leads the PhD program in Infant and Early Childhood Development, originally founded by Dr. Stanley Greenspan as the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning PhD program that is now offered at Fielding Graduate University. And he's also on the graduate faculty at ICDL. Welcome, Dr. Glavinsky. Is it still snowing there? It is still snowing. It's more icing than snowing. Oh, we've been shut in for, we were shut in for three days and it's continuing to snow here on top of all of the slushy ice that built up on the weekend. <laughs> you know, we couldn't get out this morning, actually. Yep. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, shoveling yesterday was, uh, you know, trying to lift up that heavy snow and ice. It was not was not easy. <laughs> That's part of the contract, Daria, with living in the Midwest. Yes, and uh, yeah. Toronto's not far. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for being here today and discussing mm -hmm. the psychology around this concept that Dr. Gil Tippy has coined foundation academics, which we've covered here on the podcast. And that notion that there are essential social-emotional precursors to academics and how caregivers come to grips with realizing that their children might not be ready for a typical school experience and academic learning. Most experience a sense of urgency after their preschooler's diagnosis to catch them up, get them ready for school, but in many cases this does not happen on the timeline that they're anticipating. So we are thrilled to hear your take and expertise on this topic. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, you're, you're focusing on something that I deal with every day. And in this area, there are parents who are really trying to change the school system to get them to see the importance of, of social emotional development um, as really the foundation for academic work. Um, there's a tremendous emphasis on, on teaching children cognitive skills and on drilling them and the problem that really isn't in focus yet but is getting in focus is that emotionality drives so many areas of functioning in child development and that in a child who experiences either over arousal or um, under arousal for me uh, and I know I'm dating myself it's like on the old TVs what you would see if the channel wasn't coming in clear is you'd see snow on the screen and you couldn't get the picture and one way that the, I would say emotional dysregulation affects very young children is it interferes with being able to process information clearly. And here um, I'm actually um, working with a school district and um, a private school on training teachers on the importance of emotion regulation before introducing um, academics. And then later on, um, if you ask the question, I'll talk about my first teaching experience, which really links up exactly with, with what you're saying, with what you're talking about. Yeah, it, it is um, a difficult concept on a number of levels. Uh, one, that the majority of society focuses on behavior, skill learning, uh, including schools. So schools expect children to sit and be compliant and um, don't focus on emotions and emotional regulation. Or if they do, they try and teach it 
which is not something that you can teach. You can't teach emotional and social skills. These happen within relationships through emotional experiences. And that's the whole reason the website is called Affect Autism. It's all about the affect and using our affect to affect autism, <laughs> to really help growth and development, which is true for all human beings. Um, everything is, is through emotionality, as you said, and um, more about a coin that I've heard you use, um, a, a term that I've heard you uh, say, process over product or content. Yeah, yeah. You, one of the models that I find really helpful is a model that was and is being developed by Susan Calkins, who's a psychologist, um, and I think she's down in North Carolina. And it's really a model that I hold in mind in, in evaluating children as well as working with them um, in intervention. And, and where you start on the developmental ladder is with our physiology. And we um, have differences in emotional reactivity. Um, we have differences in arousal. We have differences in thresholds where we get overloaded with, with input. And un unless that physiological stage is calm, what's going to happen to a child is that child's going to have difficulty paying attention to the world because what, what's going to happen is the child's going to be um, distracted by both internal stimulation and external stimulation. And if you have difficulty focusing on the world and, and sustaining attention on, on stimuli, um, you're going to have a lot of difficulty controlling your emotions. So physiology and attention are going to affect um, how a child responds to the world emotionally. And if that emotional system isn't regulated, what it's going to do is it's going to affect your decision making. It's hard to make good decisions when you're emotionally dysregulated. And what in all likelihood is somebody is going to function very impulsively, um, react rather than respond, and then you're getting into trouble. So if, if your cognitive system isn't working because your emotional system hasn't been regulated, where it's going to be seen is in your behavior. And, and the problem that, that we see, um, and I, I think certainly here in, in the States, you know, the, the different cultures are trained to focus on behavior. So what we have is we have um, a kind of instantaneous behavioral intervention when behavior is the tip of the iceberg. It, it's really needing to deal with the underlying physiology, attention, and emotional dysregulation that has to be worked on first in order for a child to be able to deal with the academics. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to refer people back, we had done a podcast a few months ago, um, actually last summer, about, in general, the developmental approach. And we talked about some of this stuff about behavior, about how to co-regulate. And um, I'll put the link in the full blog post here if people want to go back and listen to that or, or skim over the blog. Um, I, I wanted to talk today a little bit um, from a different side, a different angle about how is it, um, well, not only how do we convince parents that this is the best way to help their child going forward is to focus on these pre-academic skills, these social, emotional, emotional regulation type of skills um, or capacities really uh, right. more than skills. And, and also what is it that holds us back as parents from doing what's best for our children? Maybe it's a, a vulnerable spot in ourselves of being judged by others or, or not wanting our children to fall behind. 
um, maybe we can get into a bit of the psychology of this. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that part of it is um, sort of developing cultural scripts that um, culturally what we do from, very, from a very early age is we focus and function in terms of academics. So um, a child going into kindergarten, um, let's say what I see with parents all the time is the coaching on the ABCs. And it's the coaching on the ABCs um, as opposed to, let's focus on the relationship first that we have. Um, let's focus on what's going on between us. And I might ask a parent, well, how come you're, you're spending um, so much of your time on training academics and, you know, um, high probability that the answer is going to be because that's what you're supposed to do, because that's what I was taught. And that's the way that I was taught. And, you know, my child has to know how to count to 20 or count to 100. My child has to know the ABCs in order to be successful in school. And, um, you know, I, I think with lots of kids, um, they learn in many different ways. And they're picking up these things that the parents are drilling them on in all sorts of other ways. I mean, they're inundated by, by the media. And, and so parents feel that this is the way my child is going to develop. Um, I obviously can see results. If my child can recite the ABC, then my child must be learning the ABCs. Excuse me. My child must be learning the ABCs. And they, that emotional lens that, that we're focusing on um, hasn't been put on the glasses yet. And so what they're going to do is they're going to stress the academic piece. Yeah, and, and the part that I know Dr. Tippy has really um, made this point over and over again is that if our children remain in this concrete world um, where they're still struggling with these early developmental capacities that we work on in, in the developmental individual differences relationship-based model, the DIR floor time, um, that... Um, if, if you're ignoring those and just working on academics, it's a lot of memory-based skill. And once you get into the, high, the grades uh, three and higher, where you have to do a lot of comprehension and understanding and in mathematics when you have to do division, if you don't think abstractly, you cannot do those kinds of tasks. And the kids might float through the early grades, the primary grades, and then start to really struggle. And that's where you see a lot of problem behaviors because they're struggling so much. And, and the key is getting them through those early capacities to abstraction, which sounds great, but is so difficult to do. We've been working with our son for, for four or five years, and he's not over that cusp. And, you know, he might be poking here and there, but he still has a long way to go. Yeah, you know, um, you're triggering um, work with a little girl who I'm seeing, and, and the link is on um, meaning. And, and what I mean by that, Daria, is, is that um, we process information through our sensory systems. And we're taking in information in all of our senses, you know, most of the time. Um, but you have to give that sensory input meaning. So the, the second step in information processing is giving meaning to the input. And 
what I, I see with very young kids, um, you know, starting school and even in the elementary grades is they don't have the capacity really to develop the meaning. And so all of these, this cognitive information is coming in and it's like floating on an iceberg. It's not connected to anything. So those skills that really um, predate understanding, comprehension, and meaning, those are social emotional skills and they have to be planted first. Otherwise, you, you begin to talk to the child and, and what you see is the child really doesn't have um, the ability to give meaning to the experience so that it's sort of like a diffuse experience. Yeah, and, and that can happen with any child, not just Absolutely. children with developmental challenges. Um, I can think of, this might be a, a trivial example that's not exactly um, illustrating the point so great, but I listened to the radio as a child all the time and I could sing along with every song on the radio. And only as an adult, if I heard some of those songs that played in the 70s and I, I listened to the lyrics, I, oh my goodness, I was singing out loud to those lyrics when I was a child because the adult content is, is there. But you don't realize that as a child, what you're singing about. Um, you're just sort of rotely memorizing you know, melody and lyrics and, um, and the emotional content or the meaning, as you said, is, is not there. Yeah, I, I, I can give you a, a good example of, of a child who I'm seeing and I can slow down my rhythm in talking to her. I can choose um, specific words. Um, I can shorten my sentences, but she's not comprehending because she's overloaded emotionally. She's anxious because she's not understanding. And um, what I can do is I can think that because I'm pacing the situation that she's understanding, but you see that the anxiety right in front of me is overloading her system and very little is getting in. So I might say to a child, um, and I do this a lot, um, tell me in your own words what you understand me telling you. Generally, I'll get some silence and I'll either get something like, I forgot, or excuse me, or I don't know. And, you know, what, what I'm thinking of, wait a second, my language is very clear. My pace is slow enough to process the information. What's going on? Ah, excuse me. What's going on as a child who's anxious, overloaded, can't regulate her system the material is meaningless basically and to exacerbate that you have school systems that really um put this behavioral compliance load on these children so they're even more stressed yeah and um and you know using punishment like let's take away recess because you didn't do this and recess is the one thing that will help them regulate again perhaps yeah. um, or some other thing that helps them regulate and and be in these demanding situations that they they can't really tolerate yeah yeah and, and you're bringing up something really majorly important and and what that is is to help parents and teachers understand that what they're calling misbehavior and which is drawing them to you know limit set or deal with the behavior 
is really a signal I'm having trouble. So what happens when all of us, I mean, and this is a lifespan issue, um, when we experience anxiety, we might be experiencing guilt, we might be experiencing shame, what we do is we move to an action and it can be all sorts of actions. It can be breaking pencils. It can be falling off my chair in the classroom. And, and all of these are going to be dealt with behaviorally versus, wait a second, what's in front of me is an anxious child. And what this child just did poking, you know, the child in front of him or her, um, or getting up, you know, and, and walking around the room is a signal to me that this child is having trouble understanding what I'm presenting. And this child needs some individual help. And the, the need to move in supportively versus, you know, a, a teacher, parent saying, don't do this, don't do that. If you do this, if you do that, this is what's going to happen, takes them off track to what's really going on. And it goes all the way back to what we started with at the very beginning of, of the cast. The idea that a child is struggling in an emotional, social emotional manner and needs help first before we can help the child at the higher level, the cognitive level. I hope that makes sense. It, it does, and imagine how much more, um, how much more of a challenge this is for children who are nonverbal, where we, we really can't um, necessarily get that information from them in a clear way, and, and you have to guess what happened at school today while my child was there. Um, and then on top of that, children that have other challenges like seizures um, or, or other uh, co-diagnoses at ADHD or, or mental health issues and all of this added on in, in a system where the school system, the teachers, everybody, I'm sure they're professionals that have good intentions. They're just, um, they haven't been trained in this way, everything's sort of been a behavioral base. And I think the solution, Dr. Glavinsky, is we just have to open up DIR schools all around the country. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that where, be great? where children can really get, get screened, in a sense, for what their needs are, mm -hmm. as opposed to labeled uh, by their misbehaviors. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting, Dari, because, um, again, what, what you're evoking in me, I'll get called in to observe a child in a classroom. And, and typically I'll get called into the classroom um, because of a child's behavior. So I go into the classroom and I'm either sitting or sometimes you know, being permitted to interact with the kids and the observation is over. And I will say to the teacher sometimes, you know, that child is really anxious and the child will, and the a teacher will say to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I see this kid as misbehaving and what it evokes in me is an uncomfortable feeling that pushes me to, you know, some sort of negative action you're saying to me that this child is anxious. When I hear the word anxious, I have a different body feeling than when I think of misbehavior. Anxiety makes me want to support the child and help the child. And so I've been dealing with this child by timeouts, sending down to the principal's office, and what you're doing is you're giving me, you're reframing what's, what I'm seeing so that I see it in a different way. I feel it in a different way. And what I need to think about is when I see this behavior with this child that's been evoking this discomfort in me, I really have to think about conjuring up the word support. 
I need to help this child rather than to punish this child. And, and it's really interesting to see, I've seen it over and over again, where misbehavior begins to be a signal for anxiety and the relationship between the child and the teacher begins to change just based on that. Yeah, and um, the, the developmental psychologist out of Vancouver, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, talks about that so much, how when you change the lens that you're looking through, everything changes. Your assumptions change, your expectations change, and you can finally really start to address what's going on. Exactly. And, yep. and similar to the self-reg uh, that Dr. Stuart Shanker's um, program where they teach about stress. So it's not misbehavior, it's stress behavior and trying to figure out what is stressing the child and making them anxious. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what was the story you were going to tell us about from your early teaching days? <laughs> oh, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, I graduated um, from college as a psychology major. And I had a minor in education, which meant that I had 12 credits. Um, I did not have any kind of supervision. Um, I did not have any kind of teacher training. And I was in New York. And at the time that I was graduating, there was a need for um, teachers in New York. And so I um, got... Um, I was licensed as a teacher, and my first experience was what we what what they called above quota teachers. And what an above quota teacher was was somebody who you would put in the in a school building with three or four other above quota teachers, and we would sit outside the principal's office. And when a teacher was absent, the principal would come out and say, "You." are going to take this class for the day, you're gonna take the class for the day. And um, what happened was um, for, for some reason, this principal took a liking to me. And when a teacher was absent, he would put me in the class for the day. And again, I, I was really learning by the seat of my pants because I, I had no training and nobody observed me. So nobody knew, nobody knew that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, midway through the semester, there was a classroom. It was a third grade classroom um, where they were having some very severe behavior problems and the class had started with about 30 children in the, in the class and by mid-semester there were 18 children in the class and he um, said to me um, this is your classroom he got the teacher out of the class um, and he told the assistant principal that the door was supposed to be closed nobody was supposed to come into my classroom and this was my classroom and um, for the first month, um, the kids walked all over me. I, I had zero control over these kids. And being a psychology major, education minor, I was thinking about, I have to change my major. You know, I have to change my career because I don't belong in here. These kids, I can't control these kids. And about a month, probably a little more into the semester, I decided that there was no way that I was going to be able to teach these kids um, in the way the principal school was expecting me to teach, you know, traditional academic teaching. And so what I, what I felt was they, there's no way that I'm going to get these kids into my world and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get into their worlds. And the, the first two kids um, that I really started with were the two ringleaders. Um, there were two girls who were incredibly bullying and bossy with the other kids in the class. And I would scooch into where they were sitting and I would sit next to them. 
and I'd put my elbow down on the desk and I would just talk to them about anything. And um, I began to develop a relationship with them. And this began to sort of spill over to other kids in the class. So I had a little boy, I can remember it today. I had a little boy in the class who fell off his chair and he started to crawl on all fours. And the class was starting to get dysregulated. And I said to him, wow, how did you learn to do that? Can you teach me how to do that? And, you know, everybody's looking like, what the heck is going on with this guy? And he taught me how to crawl. And then we had a crawling contest in the class. And we would do activities like that where I, I didn't know the terminology because I hadn't been exposed to Stanley Greenspan's work at that point. But what I was really doing was I was relationship building, I was engaging, I was getting involved in two-way back and forth communication. And these kids were seeing me as not this ogre, you know, who was making them do things. And, and we developed this, it was really a wonderful, it was a, for me, it was a career changing experience. Um, and the, the feeling of working as a unit was really an ma amazing feeling. So um, in, at that time, we would find out our classes for the following year in September. And I walked into the principal's office and he said, Mr. Glowinski, our teacher of the gifted program is taking a sabbatical and we can't put a regular teacher in the classroom. You're going to take the gifted program for half the year because the teacher will be back in January. It was a totally different kind of experience. And, and it was also a, a major learning experience because I thought, boy, is this a plum, you know, this is a plum kind of opportunity working with gifted children. And what I began to learn about first was um, things like depression, things like all I want to do is be like everybody else. All I want to do is fit in. And there was this emotional piece that was necessary to address before, before the academics. Um, the teacher died um, at the end of the first semester, and I had the class for the whole year. Um, that's an aside, but it, it really pushed me into what I'm doing today. Um, because the thing that I, I saw in, in the initial experience was that kids who were treated as if they couldn't learn, um, who were given the message, you're not able to learn, um, absolutely were able to learn. And the, the academic piece, Daria, at the end, there was some sort of test um, that the kids took in the school. Um, and my class, they had gone up like two grades. And the principal called me down to his office and he said, how did you do this? These kids can't learn. And um, it was a really uh, major experience for me. So yeah that that's amazing it, it really is um it's everything that's in all of these developmental approach theories in practice and you figured it out without knowing the theory yeah. 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 <laughs> um because it's just it's such common sense and it goes along with the way nature works uh people develop we're we're social creatures and relationships are the most important thing in our lives Absolutely. And if you um, are putting kids with a bunch of strangers that they don't know, that's just going to add an extra layer of anxiety and you're putting demands on them all the time. That puts another um, layer of anxiety and, 
And I find that um, the most common <clears throat> challenge when I speak with parents um, who have children on the spectrum is that is getting them over that hurdle of um, not being so concerned with directing their behavior all the time and getting compliance yep. because it's just it's it's the way our society works it's what you see everywhere you go when you see families it's about directing the children on what to do that's what they do in schools and really what children need to thrive and develop is that bond that playful bond with caregivers and they need to explore and learn through play and not by being drilled um, doing worksheets and academics and all of this stuff dr tippy made the point that realistically you could learn the entire curriculum of grade you know of grade one to twelve in three months right. <laughs> so oh. if it takes my child who's turning nine soon if it takes him till he's 18 to get to that abstract stage and then we start teaching him grade one math <laughs> is there really a rush and and that is a huge leap for some parents um, and there's a book by Joel Yanofsky, a, a writer in Montreal, called Bad Animals. And he, um, he was on a blind date, and he was, eight, he was 39 years old, and him and this woman ended up uh, getting pregnant, and deciding to marry and have this child, and he has autism. And at the time that he wrote the book, I think the child was uh, around grade six, so he's probably in his teens or older by now. But he just talked about this experience of um, of how you notice that your child is different and you're not sure and then eventually your child's in fifth grade and you realize things are probably going to stay this way or things aren't going to be quote unquote normal <laughs> and just i think that happens with a lot of families where um you keep thinking from the start because of of the way society puts this pressure on us oh something's wrong with your child here's your diagnosis now you got to do this 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 and this to make them better when really um by doing that you end up in in this place years later where you realize all the things that they're missing and you have to go back and do them anyway um yes, yes. and and to to come to terms with that is a really big challenge for a lot of parents to give up the, to let go that their child is going to be neurotypical like their other child is, or like their siblings children's are, or like their parents think that their grandkids should be, <laughs> or whatever other demands are on them, to, to really let all of that go and just focus on this child in front of you and everything this child has to offer which is going to be totally different than you think or maybe not because if you're close with your child you get to know your child then you you understand all of the strengths that they have and and the joys that they have and you can share in that joy and um, work on all of these earlier capacities and worry about all that academic stuff later um, but how do you help parents through that because you know, I, I mentioned in a blog that I, I wrote for um, the rehab hospital that my child recovered from his brain inflammation in. I wrote uh, a few blogs for them, reminiscing each year when it comes on the anniversary of his hospitalization. And, and the one I did last uh, fall was that I'm going for a run or a walk in the area and I see all the little boys playing baseball. And it makes me emotional thinking about it because, you know, that's what I thought my son would be doing. My brother and I played t he played t-ball and I played boys baseball at the time they didn't have a girls league yet and then I ended up playing girls softball and and there were all these little kids and they were probably a year younger than my son. And I thought, "Oh, you know, my son, he has motor planning challenges. He's he can run, but would he be able to follow instructions and understand that this is a game and you have to wait and then you have to actually hit the ball." Would he be able to actually do that? Then would he be able to know, you know, and, and there's so, it seems like such a daunting task for him to get there. And focusing on that brings you down. 
But then I think about all of his strengths and how he has such a wonderful sense of humor and how much fun we have playing together and doing silly things and, and how much he enjoys the things that he enjoys. And then I feel really good because I see that he has these, these things that he comes up with that I think, wow, how does he realize that? He's so smart. And it might not be that he's smart on an IQ test because he can't even hold a pen yet or write or read. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's a struggle for parents. And how do you bring them through that piece? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, boy, there are so many things in what you just said that just, I have all of my circuits, you know, lighting up. Um, let me just say a, a few things. One is, um, one of the things that I do with parents all the time is I will either draw or show them um, a picture of three people in a room, the parents and two parents and a child. And I will say, how many people are in the room? And they'll look at me like, um, crazy you know um there are three people in the room and i'll say no um and then they're stuck and i will say here's a father and that father had a father and a mother that's three and the mother had a father and the mother that's six and there's the child that's seven and as these parents are working with this child they're working with this child through their histories and so their backgrounds are, uh, are going to affect how they're working with this child and if you go back in history to the time when grandma and grandpa were there um, they did things with that father and mother in a certain way and that's going to be brought into the present so there's a historical period where being directive, being, you know, um, very structured, um, they're going to bring that into the present and they're not going to think about, you know, there's another way of doing it. There's another way of working with this child. So that, that's one thing that, that history, and our ancestors and our nurseries affect how we work with our children. The, the other is, as I was listening to you, what I, I was saying is what Daria is doing is the process that all kids need in order to learn. So what was that process? I, I would call what you did mentalization. And what mentalization means is having pictures in your mind. So you were telling us a story and your memory of everything that you said to me was related to having pictures in your mind of those experiences. If you didn't have the pictures in your mind, those memories wouldn't be coming up. So um, do we have time for a little story? Sure. Okay, so here's the story. Um, very good parents want their child to be able to play with other kids, um, be able to learn, um, be able to be well adjusted. So they decide they're going to take their child to the park and they drive the child to the park and they open the back door and the child bolts out of the car because he sees some kids playing with a ball and he grabs the ball and he starts to run. And the parents say, this isn't healthy for anybody. You know, it's not fair to the kids who are playing and it's not fair to my son. And so they get him and they take him, they put him in the car and they take him home. But they're really good parents. And so they try again and they take the child to the park. They open the door and he runs out and he pushes some other kids and they take him home. But they're good parents. They try again. 
and they, they try six, seven, eight times, and every time they take him, they open the door, and he just messes up. And, but they're going to try one more time. So they try one more time, and they open the door, the back door of the car, and he starts to go out, and he stops. And he turns around, and he takes his mother's hand. And so the question is, what happened? This kid was running out of the car, you know, six, seven, eight times, and now he's holding his mother's hand and he's stopping. Well, he did what you did. He began to mentalize. And he had a picture of past, present, and future in his mind. In the past, when they opened the door and I ran out, I ended up going home and missing playtime. I don't want that to happen today. That's the present. I want to play in the park today. But if I run, my parents will put me in the car and take me home. That's the future. So in order for a child to be able to learn in an academic setting, that child has to have that mentalization capacity. You can't develop the mental capacity unless you're emotionally regulated. It just doesn't work. And so again, what we need to work on is teaching those kids prerequisite social emotional skills to give them the foundation to function academically in a classroom situation. Right, and how they build those skills is through floor time and relating and communicating with our children and playful interactions and, and getting more and more um, complex interactions going. And um, I did a podcast a few weeks ago with a Virginia Spielman called Sensory Lifestyle about yeah. how we can facilitate our children's self-regulation by helping them regulate um, not only through the co-regulation stuff that you and I spoke of in our last podcast last summer, but also um, in helping them find maybe they want to go to this lycra swing. Like last night, I actually think in retrospect now, I think, oh, we're finishing off the Easter chocolate. I think my son was just on a sugar high. But he was bouncing off the walls more than usual. And we have a lycra swing in the basement. And he literally bounced up and down in that thing for over an hour while we were playing catch with this ball and these little suction cup pieces that you throw against the wall and playing catch and the whole time like he's just like this the whole time that we're interacting and so Virginia was saying like to facilitate our children say my body's anxious I need to go and jump on the trampoline or my body's anxious I need to go do this to help me but as Jake Greenspan points out doing that alone doesn't really do much it's within the context of the interaction exactly. so you're regulated, but now you also need that input and that interaction um, with another human being to help get those capacities uh, moving forward along that developmental ladder. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you totally. We're on the same page. Um, a funny, funny story that I thought of is a, par a local parent here was complaining one day about how all these parents brag about their kids on Facebook. Oh, my kid did this, my kid did this. And so one day she posted, my kid pooped in the toilet today. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, you know, like for parents of children with developmental challenges, that's a huge deal. They pooped in the toilet. Yay. Um, that's big. That, that is, that's huge. Yeah. And just really to, to put it in their face, like, you know what? Like my kids, maybe not doing the things that your kids are, but it's in my face every day. And, and I mean, that's something else that we go through as parents is having to hear about all of these things from other people in our, in our circles, in our wider circles. And I guess we can only let it get us down if we give permission, if we, if we give the permission to let it get us down. Um, yeah. yeah. No, what do they say? Nobody can make you feel bad about yourself unless you allow it kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, related to that, um, through 
clinical experiences. I, I, I've seen so many kids who um, were having enormous difficulty and it took them longer, but they pulled it together, you know, and we're, we're told here um, in our schools that kids have to do these things, you know, according to the timeline. You have to do it that way. There's no other way of doing it. And parents believe that and they get scared. They, they get anxious. Um, nobody really tells them that some kids take longer to get there, but they do get there. And um, just because they're not in this spot right now, it doesn't mean they're not going to get to that spot. And uh, I, I think that's a message that we really have to work hard on to, you know, to pass on to parents that even though it's not done today, this time, and, you know, we'll work on it. So I think if I try to sum up what we've discussed today, what, what caregivers can take away to help get over this hurdle of, of accepting that, you know, academics can come later. We need to work on these early social, emotional, developmental capacities first. Mm -hmm. It's knowing that this is the reality, that your child does have these challenges and they're not going to get better by ignoring them and just plugging them with academics, which will just be memory based. So yeah, yeah. doing that off the bat is recognition. And then um, being able to also, as we talked about the, the mentalization, so um, <clears throat> picturing the positive relationship that you have with your child, hopefully that you have, and if not, can always work on that. Um, and your child's strengths and building from those strengths and meeting your child where your child is at and then guiding and supporting them along. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess third, having faith in the process that all of the DIR experts that I've interviewed on the podcast have all seen children develop. And as you said, it may take a while to get there, but they get there. And case after case after case, um, when I've done these podcasts, I hear stories of, of children who did have tremendous challenges and they've come a long way. And, you know, I, even for myself, I'm at the point where we have seen so much progress with our son in the um, seven years, almost six and a half years since his brain inflammation. He's come so far in the four or five years since we've been doing floor time. And then I also see how much farther he has to go so that these regulation issues don't impact him negatively every day of his life because he struggles with regulation so much. And all of the constrictors that are in his body and his nervous system and, and this and that, that hold his other cognitive abilities back. Um, and so just having faith in that process that it's going to take time, um, working on all the different techniques that we cover on the blog and in, in the podcasts, um, in time, you will notice, and I've heard uh, a few uh, practitioners say this, that oftentimes the kids that went through DIR floor time are much more well-adjusted and well-rounded and emotionally healthier than neurotypical kids because we've spent so much time on their emotional well-being. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had um, a number, and I don't think it's a small number, of parents who have said to me, um, I remember when you said to me that my relationship with my child is the most important thing in the world, and everything else gets put on the back burner, you know, because I, I was worried about academics and I was worried about whether my child was going to learn. And you said to me, your relationship with your child comes first. And I really believe it. And parents have said, who have come back years later, they've, they've said, I, 
I now understand what you told me years ago. You told me the relationship, the relationship, the relationship, and it's true. It is, and, and that's a struggle for the demands that society places on us today when parents are working for so many hours and by the time everybody gets home, they're exhausted and stressed and tired and um, yeah. we have to try and make time when we can and quality over quantity, I guess, and quantity when you can. Absolutely. I, I've had kids whose parents, um, you know, they, they spend 20 minutes a day with their children because of work schedules and the kids feel like they've been with their parents for five hours. They've, the experience has just been a rich experience. And I've had other kids whose parents spend hours with them and the kids say to me, my mom and my dad, they don't spend any time with me. It's the quality. <laughs> and with our iPhones always glued to our faces or, you know, distractions all the time, that, that's so, uh, that's such a, an issue these days as well. That's, ho that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yes. We can talk hours yes, about that is. one. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, um, is there any other, anything else you want to leave the listeners with? I could tell lots of stories, but I, I think we covered <laughs> a huge amount. I feel really good about what we've covered. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And if listeners have any questions or are interested in, in finding out more, you can go to affectautism.com and look up this podcast uh, with Dr. Glavinsky and I'll have some links to his website and um, some of the past podcasts that we referenced. And thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. And until next week, here's to Affecting Autism.